So good morning. And how are we this morning? Great. Sleep well? Yes. Any interesting dreams? Ideas? Awarenesses? Any need to comment on them or Shall we just let them become more of what they are? By the end of yesterday, a number of you had begun to twig, shall we say, to the idea that there was a bit of what might technically be called hypnosis going on, what might be called trance states. And that is the case. And this morning, I would like to take this first part and, and talk about that in a way that will put it in a context of how we think about it and how that might prove useful to yourself and to your applying this work. That the way we think about it in everyone, there's a balance of conscious and unconscious processes. And for simplicity, you could even think of these as, as right brain and left brain processes, if you wished, although that certainly is an oversimplification. That while you're sitting there, you're balanced in your chair. Even if you've put yourself in certain postures, it might be unbalanced. Your body's found a balance. You are facing here, and you're focusing and attending. You're taking these bits of sound, and you're turning them into words and turning them into meaning. And all that's happening automatically without your consideration. This is happening. That's your unconscious has been trained if you will, maybe trained isn't the word, but you've grown up and had all these experiences of learning a language and learning how to walk and how to eat. Remember all those things? You probably don't, but have any of you got children? Then you know about this firsthand. Then you've had siblings, especially younger ones, then you know about this firsthand. And of course, how many of you were children? Does that cover everybody? <laughs> then you know about this firsthand. Even if it was later on as an adult when you were learning to drive a car, especially with a parent sitting next to you, and you've got to pay attention to the wheel, and at least when I was learning, there were extra pedals, and you had to move this stick around, and there was another stick, and you had to look out the window and not run into any object, and you had to manage the adult next to you who was panicking. wonder any of us learned to drive. And you eventually did that to the point where I see any number of people like you, I won't say you, they're on the phone, they're shaving, they're putting, a, while they're driving, yeah, you've seen this. Right, so it became automatic. It became something that you have learned unconsciously, and you don't need to think about it anymore. It's a set of behaviors you can call on them. And when you get into a new vehicle, you have to reorganize a little bit, and go, okay, I got it, and I understand how this works. Meanwhile, there's your conscious mind. And your conscious mind, as George Miller found out years ago in his study, has seven plus or minus two chunks of information, which has something to do with how long telephone numbers used to be. Not now, but how they used to be. You know, it used to be area code and then four, so it was seven. Actually in two chunks, right? Maybe, you know, 734 and then 2135 is two chunks. And the idea is if you just took the number by itself, the seven's pretty much the limit. And then if you began to chunk it, of course, you could get several chunks. Now, the driving thing, you eventually chunked it into, we're driving. A, the whole braking thing might be one whole chunk, right? So by these successive processes, we take and we learn stuff. It becomes automatic in us, if you would will, unconscious. And our conscious mind is paying attention to that which is reflective. Am I comfortable? Am I feeling good? Is this interesting? Am I learning what I wanted to learn here? All those evaluations run through the conscious mind. Oh, which restaurants are good in town? That one. Now, we generate the list unconsciously. That's just right there. But then we go, oh, well, this one, this one's not so good. Because we've made an evaluation. Now, the balance of these processes, that is how much we experience unconscious processes and conscious processes, our particular balance and I'm going to draw you back to the representational systems of the visual, the auditory, the kinesthetic, the olfactory gustatory, the kinesthetic, that our balance of those is what we think of as normal walking around consciousness. And if you go into something that alters that balance, 
you go into a very kinesthetic activity, then that's an altered state. Or for some of us, it might be when we go to a concert or we put on some music. We're just transported by that music. And it's a different consciousness. That's what we listen to the music, right? Or we go to a dance and we move our bodies, you know, and obviously not much of a dancer, but we move our bodies and that takes us into a different kind of consciousness. And a lot of our enjoyment is those different kinds, different qualities of consciousness. And those balances that go on, that's where we're going out to the limits of art. Like we, we know we like to listen, we know we like to, to do something really kinesthetic, we like to have a bath and mm, feels really good, you know. Or maybe we like something active like skiing. And we go there to get that rush, to get those feelings. Or it might be that we like the music washing over us, or maybe we go to art galleries, or just walking in the woods and going, wow, this is unbelievable. And those are the edges of our consciousness. That is, how is it that we go into an altered state of consciousness? And when we get outside of that, of course, the conscious mind isn't able to track it as well. And we go more unconscious. And there's a loosening of the relationship between the conscious and the unconscious. Now, the, the purpose in bringing this up is that when we get stuck, my take on it is that's the limits of our success. The idea in NLP is we have strategies, that we have ways of moving through the world that we've learned, and they work really well until we reach the limits of where they work. And then they don't work so well. And we keep, of course, trying to do the same thing, because of course doing something different would mean it wouldn't be us. So we keep doing the same thing. Whereas what Erickson would do at that point would be to loosen the consciousness with a trance. A trance not in the sense of, woo, trance, but a trance in the sense of getting the person more in touch with their body, or more in touch with their memories, or their images, or their fantasies or more in touch with the fact that they know stuff without knowing it. Have you ever had that experience? I mean, you hear it when people say, I can't believe I did that. Right? And Erickson would be encouraging that kind of a loosening of our ideas consciously of ourselves. All these unconscious resources, all the experiences we've had we can draw on, and the ones we don't want to draw on. All of the ideas, all of the growing up that we've had, the fact that we can really intensely look at something. But a lot of the time, we're just wandering around and you know, just not paying much attention at all. But we can focus. And drawing that resource forth by loosening the relationship between the conscious and the unconscious. <coughs> and that's what that process is about. And so we got some of that yesterday when we had you talk to each other in the exercises. And you'd have one person would use one set of language patterns and one person would use another. And the idea, of course, was to practice these because the deepest trance you'll ever be in is your own conscious mind, unconscious trance. You're walking around, this is me, I feel normal now, kind of trance. And when we begin to alter that in the ways we like, we call that pleasure, we call that fun, we call that focusing and work, and we can also expand farther than that. We can by hearing different words than the one we tell ourselves. You know, the idea of the language patterns we use are supporting that trance we're currently having. If we're going to do some different languaging, we would notice different parts about the world. We'd notice how the world fits together differently than we thought it did. And this, of course, happens in life because the words don't change people. The experience does. And so we started out yesterday just with the idea that if you talk about something excitedly and delightfully, other people kind of go, well, I'm feeling pretty good myself. And the fact that the experience changes us. And so Erickson was noticing it was really about experience and about giving people experiences. And so I told you stories yesterday at the end about the violet lady the lady who was a recluse, she was all by herself in her house, this big old house, just tending her plants and not going out. And Erickson went to visit her and found a way that she could connect with the community. And the, the kid who was living in the ditch and whose life you know, was going nowhere, and Erickson thought, well, he needs to have certain experiences. And when he has those experiences, they can add up to the beginning of a normal life. And he did. He went on and got a job and got married and had children because that was Erickson's measure of success. 
Dr. Erickson did have an outcome for everyone. And at that time, he'd already decided. He didn't ask you what you wanted. Well, he did actually. I was curious. Is that he and Virginia Satir got noticed by Grinder and Bandler because if somebody came in with a particular request, quitting smoking or wanting to learn something, overcoming a fear, he would go right after that. But he also, in his mind, had this other idea, which was get a job, get married, have children. Because he was about helping people to integrate with the society, to normalize. So I tell you all this at the beginning. As we go into today, I'm going to invite you as much as you want to, and no more than that, to experience a little more alteration of your consciousness, to experience a little more difference from the way things have been before, realizing that you already do this by going to the CD shop. You already do this by going out for a walk. You already do this when you think about going someplace new and exciting for a vacation. And that that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to go further into the experiences that are possible for you to loosen up your relationship between your conscious and your unconscious to discover you are so much more than you think you are without gaining weight. <laughs> okay, I'd like to just pause a moment, let you think of that. Then I'm going to answer questions. I'll be right back, okay? Just, just a moment here. Okay, Michelle, I saw a hand there. Sure, the last two sentences were that we seek these experiences anyway in controlled environments. We go to Las Vegas. I only think that because it's a cover story this week in time. People go to Las Vegas to have their usual hometown experience? No. To experience their minds and bodies in the same way they normally do? No, they go there to stretch themselves in ways they think they'll enjoy. Approval or not, it doesn't, we're talking right now about choices. People come to the mountains here, and people go to the Grand Canyon. Also, if you're from a foreign country, a wonderful trip, you know, to go and walk down the canyon, see these spectacular sides and the light and so forth. Why do people do that? Because it gives them certain kinds of experiences they don't normally get. It takes them out of their normal balance of conscious and unconscious process. The difference is they chose it, and the difference is nobody thinks of the Grand Canyon as making you cluck like a chicken. But unfortunately, hypnosis, especially stage hypnosis, most of which is, I've seen and watched is faked, is that, well, they get people that want to act out, and then they give them a frame in which they can act out in. Conscious and unconscious process looks different. You'll discover that by the end of today. That these experiences that people are seeking when they go on vacation, when they go places, are alterations. Now, when Erickson was training people, one of the people's students and a teacher of mine, Stephen Gilligan, was requested by Erickson to go work in a mental hospital. Strange thing, you would think. And, er and, and, and Stephen was just a young kid, so he worked as an orderly, working as an assistant. He couldn't have any real, you know, wasn't a doctor. But he was in the hospital, he'd come back and he talked to Erickson. He was still an undergraduate. And Erickson and he would talk about how ordinary trance phenomena is. For instance, have you ever lost your keys? I was going to ask that. Yeah, no, I haven't found them. But <laughs> have you ever lost your keys? And then you went and looked, and they were right there where you didn't see them earlier. I even had a dream that I found it. Okay? Yeah. Uh, it was covered by something, my keys. Uh, actually, I, I lost one set of keys. Mm -hmm. And then I, I didn't bother to look for it. I had another set. And then I went to, to shopping, and I left the other key in the trunk, and I got locked out. I called AAA. They came. They couldn't open it. So I called my husband. We went back home to look for the other set. We couldn't find it. We went all the way back to another city to have it copied. And then I copied it. I came back. And then uh, there was this bag there under my keychain holder. We moved it, and the old set was there. And I had a dream about it the last night that my husband found my keys. Gnomes. Elves, right? <laughs> no, Erickson would say negative hallucinations. 
That is, we have them very often where we think we've put something down, we don't know, or fraction. In your case, what I would say that was, Masita, is fractionation. If you fractionate a person's experience, they can lose memory of it. It's actually a way of inducing amnesia temporarily. And then you're, you're, you get a dream. You know, your, your unconscious goes, I know where those are. The conscious mind can only keep track of seven plus or minus two. It's the wrong person to ask. And have you thought about how do you keep a goal in mind? Any of you raised, you said, any of you raised kids through the, through the terrible twos? Yeah, and they get something in their mind and they can't get it out. Steve Andreas thinks this is the first time that their pictures on the inside get stuck, which is a real skill later on called having goals and holding that picture of what you want. But when the kid gets stuck, they go, raisins, they went raisins, raisins, raisins. <laughs> you know, try and give them a pony. They go, no, no, raisins. You know. <laughs> because that biological ability to hold something in mind, in our mind, is developing. And later on, this is considered a very positive skill, you know, to think about what you want when you're at a party and somebody hits on you to remember who you're married to. I mean, so making internal pictures and having them compelling. How many of I, my parents had a, a dog when I was a kid, and of course it had a very long and sedentary life and, uh, and passed away. There's a certain chair where, where the dog would always sit in the window with his head right on the on the armrest there. And it's weird. You go in the house because all the furniture is still the same. And out of the corner of my eye, sometimes I, it's like the dog's still there. Positive hallucination. So what Erickson was getting at was that what the young Stephen Gilligan was seeing in the mental hospital, which was people responding to voices of people who weren't there, or people who were seeing things that weren't there or not seeing things that sh they should see, and so forth, that each of these was in fact a natural neurological gift, a capability that we have, that to imagine something and to see it clearly enough to keep it in mind and know it's our goal, that's a way to track goals. It's a way to keep track of memories. It's to know what happened and what didn't. And that to not see things, to, to not be able to find your keys, is also a skill because when we want to really concentrate, what do we do? We block out everything else. So in a sense, both of those skills, and you go on to the rest of them, things like uh, on anesthesia, where people don't feel things. Sometimes in an accident, time slows down, and you can act and you can save your child or do something important. Hear the stories of, of the mother who lifts up the car so that somebody can get out from under it. These, these are within us, and if they get kind of twisted in a way, we, we put them aside and say, well, that's a mental illness. And what Erickson was saying was that all of these, this whole range, is in fact natural capabilities. And that what we're do, utilizing, when we utilize trance, when we loosen up that relationship between the conscious and the unconscious, we're allowing more of those resources to come forward, gently. I hope you got that yesterday. It's not about doing things to people. It's getting in the water with them and going, come on in. Let's just settle back and relax, notice our bodies, and notice our thoughts, and where do we want to go? Sometimes I walk around in a mall, and you'll see people, I'm sorry to say, usually women, some guys now, of course, and they got the purse, right? They got the bag on the arm. Can I borrow your bag there? You see this, too, where they'll have the bag on the arm, and they're walking around shopping. And the arm doesn't move. Check it out next time you're in a mall. You, there's a lot of this going on. What's this? It's catalepsy. It's a hypnotic phenomena. Well, it's good because it holds, it holds the bag there. So, I mean, it is useful. The thing is that these things are happening all the time around us, just like the other day when the group where the one group, the guy's going, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help this person to get into this state. Meanwhile, she's going, beep, beep, and it goes back the other way. So this is happening around us, and it's just a matter of beginning to realize it and beginning to realize it's a capacity. And one of the gateways to that is through loosening up language. Which language are we loosening up? The internal dialogue in our own head. Years ago, I worked with this hypnotist, a really good one. We had this plan where, with the person's permission, we would have them say everything they say on the outside on the inside, and everything they say on the inside on the outside. 
Right? So what you say to yourself, you'd say to others. We, yeah, we figured they'd last about five minutes. <laughs> Which, I mean, even as some of you kind of laugh nervously, what does that say about what we say to ourselves? Pretty cruel. Pretty, pretty cruel sometimes. And, and, and the thing is that, here's the deal, as you know in NLP, it's the form, not the content. We respond to the content. But if you change the form, let me give you a real simple example. Think of a car. You can think of your car. It's all right. Now, you listen. It seems to be a car. How did that change your experience? I became curious suddenly. Well, I just think of it in terms of the imagery. If I say it seems to be a car. Like the car I had in mind sort of, you know, it, it got kind of... Um, Faded a little bit. Got a little faded, yeah, it got fuzzy and so forth. And this is the relationship between the language and the internal representation. That, and, and even if you only hold it a second, it goes, yip, no, it's my car. You know, so that there, you've seen the Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. It's wonderful where Calvin and Hobbes is a cartoon, for those of you that don't know. And, and Calvin is this little wild kid, you know, this tall, and maybe four, maybe five. And Hobbes is his stuffed um, tiger. Although when no adults are around, the tiger actually gets big and talks to him. And so, so Calvin is in a cubist painting. And if you know what those are, it's like the wall or like this, like this. And, and it was Calvin is trapped in a cubist world. And he's going on. And, and, he, and eventually it goes back to standard black and white standard frame. And he goes, turns to his dad, you're still wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so we can turn things back. But here's the thing. If you turn things back, you get the same thing you got before that same balance of conscious and unconscious. We want to encourage is that you can notice that world and other worlds, the worlds that you already like to occupy, like going to an amusement park or walking in the woods or listening to music or visiting with friends, and expand that a bit more. And one of the ways to expand that is through language. There's a, I realize this was so pedantic, I'm going to do it anyway. It's a play by Moliere called The Bourgeois Gentleman. And in this play, Mr. Jordan, who of course would be an aristocrat being a French play, that Mr. Jordan wants his assistant to write a letter. And he says, oh, I'm going to write a letter. And the assistant says, in prose or poetry, sir? And Jordan goes, are those my choices? And he goes, yes, sir, it's either prose or it's poetry. And he thinks, you mean I've been speaking prose all my life and didn't know it? And it's kind of the same thing with us, that we started out yesterday with an exercise that got us to realize that a number of us were speaking, and I'm saying as a general description, speaking more specifically or more generally. Go ahead. And that we would find that if we got up into these generalities, some of us just kind of faded away. We went, oh, come on, you know. Get real, or I don't remember what was said, or some reaction. Meanwhile, others of us went, ooh, my favorite words. <laughs> Relationship, partnership, wisdom, clarity, happiness. We discovered yesterday that we like to hang out in one area. Now, in that sense, for some of you that like the nominalizations more, like the more abstract language, that you found the meta model a little tough, didn't you? This is like, you felt like they were trying to pin you down. It's like, no, I'm more flexible than that. And you are, and you are. And the usefulness of the meta model was to find a moment, an experience, either of greatness and of potential and of ability, or of difficulty that you want to transform. And in the other direction, when we got started to yesterday, some of you found that the course had been made a lot of sense up till this point. And suddenly it's like, what is he talking about? The organization of the performance of management can lead to enthusiasm and confidence that could cause integration of useful intelligence. Yes. Of course, this may remind you of some people. And now we're speaking to the idea of their internal dialogue and what kind of world that creates. And how if you meta-modeled them, that would change their consciousness, would it not? And that's what we're talking about here, is noticing how we can utilize changes in language to nudge, to encourage changes in consciousness. The person can always go back to, 
And that's fractionation. People do that. They'll go, and they'll go, well, now that I know that I can go back to the way I like it, maybe I'm willing to wander a little more, you know. Ah, oh, this isn't so bad after all. And so those were the exercises that we did in the afternoon. So that's where I want to start this morning, was with that, and I take questions on that, because that's kind of a lot to gather in, that the world is perhaps differently organized than you thought. At least we're offering you a different frame on that world. Questions, observations, reactions, Masada? Back to doing something unconsciously, how do you explain this when you have a dream and it happens in a few days, in the next couple of days or something? I don't explain it. I think you can offer explanations. I'm, I'm of the, the school of psychology that says that people make up explanations afterwards. That uh, this is, this, uh, I'm wandering, we may want to. <laughs> that uh, when you do something, that when you do it, if you have any competence at all in it, you're doing it unconsciously. How many of you have had to drive consciously? By the way, this happens usually when you go to a country where they drive on the wrong side of the road, <laughs> and you're suddenly having to drive consciously, and how much, how much thought it takes up and how exhausting it is. Right, so you learn something unconsciously. Now, when you've learned it, you explain that to yourself with a part of the brain back here called the interpreter function. This is uh, Michael Gazaniga's work and uh, some others that have been working on this, also Martin Seligman, that we have an interpreter function that explains later why we did what we did for coherence. It gives us a sense of self. It's a very useful function. So I, I'm of the school that you can make up explanations, but what's more important is how can you point yourself to create more of what you want. I would say if you got a dream and it happened a few days later, I'd be going, whatever, whatever works in your language, I'd be going, go girl. You know, it'd be like, I want to encourage that. I'd be thinking, geez, I wonder how soon I'll find myself doing that again. I'd be going, thank you. That was wonderful. Is there another? I would just want to encourage it rather than try to explain it. Uh, explanations are theories, and there's a lot of neuroscientists working. I don't working. Know how it happens. Who knows? Who knows? But I do believe this that the unconscious, with the millions of connections going on per second between the corpus callosum and between allowing you to stand and talk and lean like that and have your questions and speak multiple languages, that all of that is so much more than your conscious mind going, I wonder how that happened. Now, conscious minds are very important. They're how we're, we evaluate whether it's, we want something or not. They help us to organize and focus ourselves, to run it through our neurology in a systematic way so we can learn it. And there is a relationship between the two. P too many people try to do things consciously they should do unconsciously. It's like, have you ever been learning a foreign language and you, you could say more, but your conscious mind was holding you back because you thought you might make a mistake? Yeah, that kind of experience. This is, a, this is the evaluator. You don't speak a language consciously. You speak unconsciously. Your conscious mind can evaluate, how am I doing? Yeah. I was just <clears throat> wondering. Yesterday, somebody from my study group asked me that once when we become consciously aware of these two um, gathering information, meta model, making meta model, we should be able to use this language pattern to resolve things with ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. I would say you can use language patterns, you can use a self uh, encouraged trance to facilitate a loosening so that new possibilities can come up. Richard Bandler is very specific on this point, as well as John Grinder on other occasions, that NLP is a mixed state communication. That when you're teaching somebody to re-anchor an experience, that may not make sense logically, but you all know that's the case. That you can imagine a colored circle and you can put that resourceful moment in it and you can step in it and go, ooh, that's good. And you step out and then you're not in the emotion. Weird. Now, you can go and go, now where in my future would I like that? You see that moment and you step in and you put that together, what you see and what you hear and with that feeling, and you create a new experience. So there is a structure to it. If you will, there's almost like a, a, a calculus, a, a way of putting those things together. The way you do that, though, is with a conscious intent and with the unconscious ability to have the feeling and to step out of the feeling. So it is. It's all of NLP mixes these two. 
Just most of the time, it feels like the conscious mind's in charge. That's all. Any other questions, observations, reactions? Is that a question? Yeah. Um, is uh, uh, this uh, skill uh, taught to um, drug addicts? And so let's pause a moment, let them join us. Hi there. Hello. Okay. So to drug addicts in uh, medical uh, institutions, because drug addicts usually use drugs, especially creative people, to get in the state of unconscious mind and create. But right now I know that they treat it with drugs, with medication, and pretty much nothing else. Is something like this going on in this medical institution? Okay, there's a couple of questions there I'd like to address. And, and first of all, yes, I would say, uh, what can I say? I, I, I inhaled, uh, I didn't inhale, which is what I'm supposed to say, which is politically correct. <laughs> it was another era, it was another time. It wasn't illegal. I didn't exhale. I didn't exhale, yeah. That <laughs> um, yes, that very much there is a tradition, although uh, the tradition basically goes back to the, the symbolists in Paris in the turn of the century with the, is it? Absinthe, yes, the absinthe and things like that, and then the opium and so forth, to create altered states, to have more creativity, although I'm sure alcohol has been used longer than that, altered states again, and that certainly there is a reputation, if not a fact, that people in the creative fields tend to use this to get them out of their, their current mindset. And I said, I think there's some sort of cultural uh, prejudice or, or uh, 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 bias there that may not be there, but certainly people get encouraged. And certainly... Drugs offer an altered state of consciousness. Now, two things. If you are trying to feel better and you don't know about re-anchoring and you've never been to the Colorado Rockies or you've never you know, flown in a, little, in a little biplane or something and somebody says, try this pill, and you go, wow, that was easy, then what happens? You've got an anchored response. And so in that sense, the person goes, that really works. You know? The other thing to keep in mind is that we live in the age of the industrial age. And the reason I bring that up is that a very short time ago, pretty much any drug you would use was in nature and just wasn't that strong. So now we have industrially refined substances that are on a, a strength that is unimaginable even 10 years ago, much less 50. Remember, aspirin is a plant. It was originated from a plant. And you used to grind it up. And... Uh, I don't know, the work of William Faulkner, if you read his, that there are certain twigs that they would have in the South, they'd have the, the kids sniff it because it was relaxing. Or if you go to Peru and they're chewing the leaves because they're up so high and there's not enough oxygen. But the real difference between chewing leaves and smoking something that was made of the leaves, turned into powder, and then refined again. So there's a sense of overwhelming the system. But what I want to get to is that the person goes, I have a reliable way to feel good. And they become, in my way of thinking, overly focused. They think that's the only way to get that. And one of my colleagues, Ed Reese, tells this wonderful story because he, he has direct experience with these substances. And so he realized that utilizing submodalities, now you haven't, you haven't had submodalities yet, but it's coming up. The submodalities are the bits of the modality that you could build up the experience so the person could have a great deal of it without the drug. This is the placebo effect in action. And you realize that placebos work so well that the more exotic the disease they're trying to cure, the more often the placebo does the work. In fact, in studies now, placebos are outperforming Prozac. Yeah. So Ed would sit the person down, whatever their favorite drug was, and have them pretend. You would know which drug I'm using. Pretend, you know. And then have them... And Ed might even play along and go... Here. Now, there's nothing there. You understand, this is what we were talking before about positive hallucination. And the person would do the same thing, and all of those signals would begin, and then so Ed would find out not only the, the beginning anchors, but like, how does, how does the room change? And the person says, well, you know, it, it tinkles a little. He says, okay, I bet you can make it tinkle a little, can't you? And the guy goes, well, yeah, I can. And it says, and, and then what happens is then I begin to feel warmth in my body. And Ed said, and where in your body do you feel that warmth first? And the guy says, oh, kind of here. And he says, and how easily can you allow it to spread? You're hearing some language patterns we've been working on? 
Right, so combining the submodalities of what are the visual, auditory, and kinesthetic of the experience. Well, the person goes, geez, why am I spending all this money? They begin to realize that, in fact, that they're manufacturing that experience. Now, all of us have had a different version of this. We fall in love with someone, you know, and we think they're the source of our feeling. Well, we think they are. Yeah, think about that a moment. Because we focus, there's, that's, that's, there it is. That's how I get that feeling. But where's the feeling? There's a certain set of, of anchors that go off, that go, <sighs> and we get to have that feeling. And then that person goes away, and they, they took our anchors with them. <laughs> when in fact, that was its own kind of hypnosis, because that capacity was always there. And what would it be like to be able to get to that feeling and then find an appropriate partner. <laughs> Sometimes those anchors don't give us the whole picture, if you know what I mean. Some of you are nodding with enough life experience to know. And yet, of course, those feelings are incredible. Uh, back to drug, I don't know if it's relevant. I was wondering why the same drug has different effects on different people, or herbs. Or herbs, or yeah, well, this goes back to the idea that different people start in a different balance of conscious and unconscious process. They have different personal histories. I mean, I know people that, were, that got addicted to painkillers because they had constant headaches. And then they realized that certain painkillers worked other, better than others, particularly the illegal ones. And so what brought that person to the drug was very different than what you were saying, perhaps the artistic path. So, of course, there's going to be all these differences. And totally opposite. People come to all sorts of things for all kinds of reasons. Ask the people why they're here. You find all kinds of reasons for wanting to have this experience. Okay. Yeah. To, to bring around the, some completion to your question, there are a number of people working in the prison system I know, in uh, uh, Georgia and other places, who are offering an alternative in terms of the standard treatment. And no less than the president of the APA, uh, Martin Seligman again, uh, pointed out in what you can change and what you can't that drugs by themselves for a treatment are an insufficient, that there needs to be change of mind as well. He says people who go on antidepressants and then come off them, I mean the antidepressants seem to work for a while, they come off them and there's no difference, but if they have some kind of way of reordering their thinking, and we get that's a reordering the conscious and the unconscious. It's a rearranging the anchors. It's a changing the internal dialogue. What do all those do? They change the sense of self, how the person, what capacities they have, that that's what's needed. So we have a way of doing that. There are other ways. Uh, we're here, so this is the way we're teaching. Yes? Can anchors trigger conflicting feelings, or is that something that's more of the conscious and unconscious mind separate? I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> flirting, I know I didn't do it very well. Flirting is incongruence. Is that you can be congruent, right? But in fact, flirting is an example of mixed signaling. It's where it's come away closer. So you turn away from the person, but then you look at them. <laughs> So you, you give a mixed signal, and I know guys, we hate that, don't we? You know, it's, yeah, we, but we like, we, like we, we, want, we want the look. Just give us the look, you know? And they go, ah, okay. <laughs> Instead, we're getting this, mm, 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 they're not looking at it, they're twisting the hair, and you know, we have to read magazines, we have to steal women's magazines off the stands in the, in the checkout and read them real fast. Okay, that means, okay, I got it. You know? <laughs> so what I'm saying with that example is, yes, in life there's often a lot of mixed signals. And sometimes they're intentional. And sometimes they're just what the person knows how to do. Michelle. So are anchors related to the consciousness or the unconsciousness? I guess I, I didn't get a clear explanation there, but I apologize. And not at all. Uh, anchors, I would say anchors are what we already have that we're responding to. 
you respond to an anchor, you find yourself consciously responding to the anchor. So I would say related to the unconscious, though I had never thought of putting it that way. Okay. So, what I want to know at this point is how ready you are, how curious you are, whether you really are ready to go on vacation. You came to the mountains, right? You got away from home, you know, you turned off the cell phone, the pager, right? You, you got out of the suit and you got in the more relaxed clothes. And so, are we really ready to go to a vacation state of mind and body? This is yes. This is no. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, yesterday, starting out with physiology access, tonality accessing, imagery, all ways of encouraging a loosening of the conscious and unconscious, we began to look at how we would go more abstract, how we'd offer positive generalities, how we would give permission you can, you might, you might find it easy. I'm curious what would happen if you did. In other words, expanding the person's sense and making new connections, which we did when we took the resource to the future, which we did when we connected to other times in their life that they had that resource, and did that with nominalizations. These being a number of them that were added by our capable staff, thank you, that creativity, curiosity, generosity, contentment, <coughs> Happiness, clarity, wisdom. Now, all those words, of course, mean what they mean to us. And Erickson understood that when he used a word that the person liked or was related to something, balance, they could make sense of it. So speaking in a more general way, letting the person find the experiences themselves and relating those experiences to each other with unspecified verbs. As uh, Cheryl gave us an example yesterday, when speaking very specifically, we can really direct someone. And yet, if we want to let them wander a bit, if we're endeavoring to have them loosen, then we find that using words like understand, wonder, become aware of, discover, remember, sense, allow for a more flowingness. Unspecified nouns. The idea that it's about people. You know, it's... People often have the experience. Well, who am I speaking to? The person I'm talking to. And they go, oh, yeah, people, oh, I'm having that experience now. So beginning with this, we played around, got to know that we could deliver an instruction with that, that we could direct or at least encourage a person's experience in different directions, and we found that it happens pretty naturally. Some of us do it by watching television, a definite trance state. Some of us do it by participating in sports. Some of us do it by going to a dance or other things. We all encourage ourselves into these other states. And from this, we got a themes. Our themes are you can't not communicate. If you say something, for a moment at least, the person's going to have a sense of it that the meaning of your communication is the response that you get, that your mind and body are the same system. They're just aspects of the same system. And as long as you keep going and take the feedback, there's no failure. It's just feedback. Two processes yesterday, key to this, which is putting experiences together, taking experiences apart. Now, we do both. When you learn a skill, any of us, anybody like a carpenter here or a cabinet maker? Any of you do a craft of some kind? And when you do that, you notice you get make more and more distinctions as you learn about it. It's like if you work with wood, you get a sense of which woods do what and the grain and, and how to cut with the grain and so forth. And it can be in anything else you do, whether it's sewing, whether it's cooking, that you start out going, okay, hot food, uh, hot, spicy, bland. And then you go, well, no, then there's a kind of Southwest spicy, and there's a Chinese spicy, and, there's, and you develop more and more distinctions. That's taking things apart. And then, of course, you take all those distinctions and you put them together into a meal. 
into a table, into making an outfit. So these are natural processes. And what Erickson noticed is that at a larger level, people are fractionating. They're, as you are, you're going into your thoughts and coming back and going, oh, what did he say? Did I miss something? Well, we're all doing that, going in and out of trance. And we're putting experiences together, of course, as long as we hold ourselves this way, the usual way. This goes with this. That doesn't go with that. And it's like, you're not going to wear that shirt, are you? That doesn't go together. That we have our usual way of adding things up and putting them together. And if you utilize this, you can take things apart in other ways. You can acknowledge how a person is already dividing up their world. And you can assist them in putting it together in different ways. Gently, more connectedness, even to connect it to where a resource now will be there later for you to utilize, like this one. Erickson also, this is amazing because the philosophers were only starting to write about this. Austin had written a book called How to Do Things with Words. And Erickson, about the same time, yet Erickson on his own, talk about theory and practice. Erickson had worked these out at the behavioral level. Now, what did he worked out? If I say, I know that you can do this. Yeah? I assert something, right? If I say, I don't know that you can do this. If I say, you know, I don't think that you can do this. I'm being obvious, right? In all cases, you can do this. That, all this stuff in front there, that presupposes you can do this. That's what the, the phrase means. That there's these language patterns that when you say them, they make this seem more possible. If I say, do this. He can do it. He can go. You know, he can have all sorts of reactions. But if I look at him and go, I wonder how easily you can do this. And these language patterns are called presuppositions. And they go right by. <laughs> People are unaware of them because they're so busy processing the sentence. And what's what we're going to introduce this morning? Once again, it's a way of smoothing the process. It's a way of making it easier to loosen to the degree that you want to. Introduce the first set here, and those are of awareness. I know you can do this. I realize that this will be easy for you. Do you realize that? No. Are you aware you've already been doing this? When you see yourself doing this, you'll recognize how easy it really is. I have a question. I didn't quite get it. You're telling, you're saying that uh, we feel that we can do it, no matter what you say. Right, because the message underneath is that do. you can do it. And of course, you can put any other message in there as well. Now, let me give you again, remember I talked about unconscious competence, how people are already doing this in ways that are less than useful, right? All right, this is the famous, famous therapist example. Chris, you're elected. Chris, do you realize you're resisting me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it, when I say that, do you realize, it's like, it's make real anything that follows this word. You're resisting me. So do you realize, like make real? And of course, Chris goes, uh, no, yes, maybe. <laughs> Because you're trapped in a way. But you can also use it for good. <laughs> you can say something like, in just a moment, you'll begin to realize. Or just say, it says, you realize you're already doing this naturally. And it's only a matter of finding out how. Which is a very different use of the very same thing. Now, this one has gotten untold millions into trouble. 
this special gentleman and ladies, there's a relationship issue here. You know, when, she, when, when you say, I know what you mean, and she says, no, you don't. No, you, don't. <laughs> you know, I know, I know, I know what's important. No, you don't. Now, Erickson would use this differently. He'd say, you know, your unconscious mind knows so much more than you do. It knows how to beat your heart, how to blink your eyes, and allow you to understand the words I'm saying. And people go, okay. Or you know more than you think you know. You go, yeah, sure. So how you use these different kinds of words, you can recognize examples of this in your own experience. Were those examples you just gave fractionation? They could be if I continued. One statement is towards the unconscious. Then I could have gone, and your conscious mind. But no, at that moment, they weren't. They were strictly about just restricting myself to the pattern. Are you aware yet how you could use these patterns? I'm curious to know if you realize the impact they'll have. What would you need to notice yourself getting better at this? Let's just put these on the front end of the sentence. And of course, it takes the slightest bit of thought. What message do you want to deliver? So we come back to where we were yesterday. You might want to deliver, say, satisfaction. And you know how, how and you know how pleasing satisfaction feels. Do you not? You're always aware of a job well done. Or something like that. So these go in front of things like this. Because you're presupposing or even in front of our unspecified verbs, you're aware of understanding on many levels. Yeah, I am. And with that, you can become aware of a warmth and satisfaction and curiosity beginning to build inside. You don't have to acknowledge it. It'll just continue on its own. Yeah. When you use, uh, use those uh, words in a negative sentence, isn't that like fractionation? You're giving different feeling to the person? Could be. Could be. Concern yourself with focusing on the pattern. I, I keep thinking about this. It's like learning something where if you're learning golf, first you practice, right? And, and you drill. And then after you got that, then you, you begin to practice the whole game. And then you actually go play. So... Feel free to restrict yourself to this pattern. And as you become aware of other ones coming up, you go, oh, I'm doing that one too. It wouldn't surprise you, would it? All right. Another pattern of presupposition is time. Erickson was so great at this because people, as I indicated, towards the end of his life, they were afraid to go to him because he was going to put them in trance. That damn Erickson. I was in trance before I got on the airplane in New York. So people would come to Erickson and say, well, well, I, I want to explain everything before you hypnotize me, you know, kind of thing. And Erickson said, well, before we begin, let's have a chat. Are you comfortable? Are you aware you're comfortable? And as you feel more of that comfort, I wonder what other awareness is. Creativity, curiosity, might also be coming to mind and body. I don't know, but your unconscious mind does. And he'd wake up an hour and a half later and he'd go, now would you like to have the session? <laughs> <laughs> so before, before we begin, I also began to do what? As while, something we were playing with yesterday, beginning to do both at the same time. So the utilizing of time, 
even though we're here in the present, if we have a difficulty, what are we doing? It's about stuff from before. Multiple thoughts. We're thinking about the future, but we're here in the present. Multiple thoughts. We're thinking about what we want and what the people who are important to us want. So fractionation in many ways, and by weaving time, while you think about that, another part of you can be aware and realize that you're learning in new ways. This is like sort of the Chinese menu approach to Ericksonian hypnosis. You take one from column A and one from column B and one from column C, and you begin to play a little bit. Because that's what we're here to do. Gentle, polite, with respect. Chris. Just uh, reading these examples, using presuppositions is really similar to leading, is it not? Like it says here, you may wonder which side of your body will begin to relax first. And when you say that to someone, they think, oh, I'm going to relax now. And which side's going to relax first? So it's a clever way to lead them into. I, and I would say it's a clever way to invite. Okay. Because what you, no, I don't disagree. I say a clever way to invite because maybe they do it and maybe they don't. Okay. And if the person doesn't do it, if they go, they stiffen, then you could say, say something and you're aware that you know how to stiffen your body. And that goes back to what I said about being sensory based at times. So the person you're aware, you know how to stiffen your body. And you can feel that thoroughly as you wonder what you're going to feel next. Which, of course, at some point, they're going to feel something next. So there's a truism there. Now, once again, frame on this. All this is about inviting a loosening of the conscious and unconscious so that more problem-solving abilities can come forward, so more resourceful memories can come forward, so that more new combinations of our past and our abilities and our rep systems and our beliefs and all those can begin to interact in new ways with new solutions. In the Ericksonian work, you can be directive with it. It's called NLP. In a, my understanding of a more Ericksonian approach, you're less directive. It's more about inviting a space in which the person can reorganize themselves, can realize they're more than they were. So, I think it's time for an exercise and or a break. Which would you like to do first? What I'd like you to do is to find your partners. Three. One of them will be you. <laughs> and take your break and meet me back here at 20 after, and we'll get ready for the exercise. Thank you very much.
Well, since you've been practicing these patterns, you're already aware of their impact. I'm curious about what else you've noticed. By the way, did you see how I just presuppose you've been practicing? <laughs> By asking a question about something else, yeah, I use the linguistic pattern that, you know, prior to this moment, you might not have realized what impact this kind of language could have. And you may have been using it naturally. Or unnaturally, for that matter. That does weird things too, you know. If you pause for a while. I mean, Erickson was, he talked to somebody for a while and then he just stopped. When I went through training with Stephen Gilligan, we spent half a day on meaningful looks. And you'd look at a person and go. <laughs> I don't know if it did, really did any good or not, but it got you aware of the fact that your communication has an impact. And that the analog, as we call it, or the meta communication, is just as important as the words. It's a little reminder there because we have been concentrating on the words. Yeah? And that the way you deliver the words has a huge impact. That, that demo we had earlier. Was that beautiful? And they got into it, that's right, and they were going back and forth. And what if they'd gone, and you can be aware of the security of your foot on the. <laughs> Tonality, I exaggerate for the sake of the example that the way in which you say things still counts. Remember that exercise from the very first morning? You can always just look over in the direction of the person and go, and? That'll buy you a lot of time. <laughs> Think of something else. And if you just go, and, and you don't say anything, and then you see the person nodding, they got whatever it was anyway. Yeah. So, comments, observations, reactions. Yes, first over here. I just come in with my group that um, I have been doing meditations and where you try to get really quiet and really still. Mm -hmm. And when you try to do that and you get so peaceful, then you get agitated when you get into a more crowded, congested area. This kind of meditation to take yourself down and incorporate the outside noises mm -hmm. would be more useful when you're in a crowd and the, the noise and confusion just gets to be too much for you because you, you now have a way to still incorporate the calmness with some of the noise and distractions that are available. It's a very nice learning, a very deep learning. Yeah. Oliver. Mine was just a comment. I mean, if Monet and Chris made an audio CD, I'd buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I reached the state, and it was deep, centered, and I still feel centered. I mean, it was very great. Nice. Great, great. And I want to speak to the thing that Erickson would say, is the resources are already within you. As one of his students, Steve Langton, said, and Steve Langton also has written a number of seminal books in the field, really great books on Ericksonian hypnosis. He, borrowing a line from Erickson, said, the answer is within. So I say that and pause that moment because it was within Chris and Monet to do that. Oh, I may have assisted in helping create an environment for that to happen. We all have this capacity. Chris, you want to say I something? To come. We had a wonderful session, and for the first time, I really felt that I had a grip and um, to get myself into this process. And when I was sitting in the warm, comfy chair, um, Monet did something really fabulous for me. I wanted to feel openness, because mm -hmm. especially about this material. And she said, she said something to the effect of, and while you feel a part of your body is open, and it just went right here to my stomach meridian, mm -hmm. and just opened up like this rip, and this red light came out, and then it was so, ugh, it really got me, I wanted to get itchy in my chair and wiggle mm -hmm. around, and they did such a fabulous job, and so this has really, this round was the best. All right, obviously, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and... Really, we go back to that demonstration, the security that you two created for Chris to open up. Because this isn't like, okay, we're going to, because you make it sound like it was a ripping open or something. But that was something Chris did, is my point in bringing this up. Is you created a context in where you could go, and there's this. And he goes, yeah, there is. And the clutter had stopped. 
and the external stuff had been incorporated to the point where we could focus within and go, yeah, and let these things come out. And as I say, they've always been there. It's just that configuration, to make a metaphor, didn't have you notice. And then you shifted, oh, maybe a little, maybe a lot. And suddenly you go, oh, wow, there's all this other me there. Yeah, wonderful. What was, what was really um, the most effective is that she asked me to focus on a part of my body and it was so mm -hmm. kinesthetic is different than saying someone and you feel this and you feel that putting it giving it an assignment to an area of the body really did something for mm -hmm. me and was, i think she asked and where do you feel this? yeah i was going to say how did you know to, to mention the the stomach because this is a crucial thing as we know from before over specification can take the person out she asked him. and specification can really lead the experience forward so it's hard to make a rule except you go with the experience what did you notice um, I just suggested that he might, when he described the feeling of openness, he might feel this you know, beginning in a certain part of his body. And, and oh, I like, in a certain to, part of his body, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I don't remember the exact words I, I used, but he motioned to his stomach, which was yeah. great, because then it was Oliver's turn, and then Oliver could use right. that in his fractionalization, yes. so it, it, it fed on yeah. And that's what I, because I, what I loved, Chris, is when you started to talk about it, mm -hmm. you're using this hand, and he said, I really got a grip on the stuff this time. Mm -hmm. Now, I point that out, not in any way to put Chris on the spot, but that we all do that. We're going to get to that further on. in the, It's called organ language, mm -hmm. where people go, get a grip, uh, and they signal, and they point at parts of their body, and they use metaphors like, I feel a weight on my shoulder. And this is another way to speak nonspecifically. You said, a certain place in your body. And he goes like this, and you go, well, I think I got an idea. Yeah, and, and you go with that. And then you said, get a grip of it. So now I might use that, that analogy, that metaphor with you. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad you're getting a grip on the material. And he will, he'll go, yeah, he understands because, well, it's rapport. He was doing this. Now I do this. And it's like, ooh, friendly primate, understand. Mm -hmm. So these things are building on the very simple rapport work you were doing. It's just an artful use of language to increase that, encourage that, provide a space for what's already within. Now, there were several other hands. I want to acknowledge those. Yeah, Cheryl. Um, well, I would describe the experience as pleasant. Yeah. <laughs> How do you know if, or is the goal, the inner peace that you feel, that pleasantness that you feel, or is that different from a trance state? Okay. And how do you define Yes. At this point, we're just going in the shallow end, going in a little deeper. A number of people here, very strongly developed conscious minds, and satisfying that concern. And Erickson would do that. He might see people six times just doing trance training. In other words, the kind of thing where they would you know, sit and get peaceful and then go deeper. And the, the stories of Erickson are, boom, people went into trance. Well, that was called a reinduction signal. He'd done it before. And so we're getting into it. So if you got a pleasant feeling, you wanted a pleasant feeling, then that was, the exercise fulfilled itself from the explorer point of view. From the others, theirs was an opportunity to practice the language patterns, to develop the feedback loops, a facility with this skill. We will be going further. And as I say, inviting you to go in and swim around as much as you'd like. Yeah. For me, I was trying to come back, but I didn't want to come back without bringing something with me. Yeah, anchor. it was pretty good in there, right? So I just brought a bunch of flowers with butterflies around it, so I uh -huh. go like this All and right. remember the state. I can see that. Yeah. And also, I have an observation in fractionation. Mm -hmm. When you're doing fractionation, when you go one part of you, and you start reducing the part that doesn't want to do it, it works real good. Stop okay, going. so you're, you're beginning to think in terms of technique. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that works, pa I'm sorry. Pain relief. Yeah. The idea we talked about before here is that when she had, oh, I've got this and this, you know, and it was like, well, you could have both, and you could have more of one than the other, less of the other, and so forth. Now we're getting into a technique, yeah. And we'll get there. How quickly they learn. <laughs> yeah. So you talked a little bit earlier about, um, so if a person's major representational system is visual, mm -hmm. you start taking into what they hear and what they feel, that's going to be more of an altered state. More of an altered state, because they're not used to, they, they have great facility with pictures, for example, then they might not have as much facility with words or as much facility with feeling. And typically, typically, 
that will be a very unusual experience for them. They'll go, ooh. How do you incorporate more of the auditory in that? Like, what, what can you give me some examples? Well, the, the very language patterns we're using uh, are, for most people, expanding their listening. That is, they haven't heard things like you can be, have, have both of these. Or they haven't heard things like a part of you and a part of you. They haven't heard things like and. A lot more people hear but. He starts hearing and. One of the students that studied with Milton Erickson directly and also uh, was the first editor of the first journal, the Richard and Bandler and John Grinder's NLP, Bill O'Hanlon by name, has successively gone from NLP to Ericksonian hypnosis to inventing possibility therapy. His latest work is called inclusive therapy. And he's noticing if you simply speak to people inclusively, I say simply with all these language patterns, inclusively with people, that you can get transformational change by acknowledging and speaking the language of and and including, and there's this and that, and and they're both together there. And sometimes you feel this way and mostly feel that way. A few times you don't. And getting people to develop using language to make distinctions. If you think about what is a problem like for somebody, remember? They're stuck, right? And the past and the future are the same. Because they think what? It was a problem. It is a problem. It will be a problem. So there's a sameness about experience. And, and Erickson, part of the whole thing of getting into a trance was, well, there's a different experience. By example, you're in a different state of mind. And in that state of mind, you can start remembering other times that don't fit the problem. And as we all know about anchoring, you can put those differences in the future, and suddenly, what are you doing? You're utilizing fractionation to break up the problem. What was all the same is now there's the problem, and here's resource. There's a worry, and here's a feeling of possibility. And of course, they both may be true, and then one may become, quote, more true than another. And then inclusive in that, that you're not all of one mind, at least not all the time, maybe a few times. And you're aware of that, are you not? There were some more hands. 